Welcome back, everyone. The second panel of the day is held in conjunction with the Konstantinos Karamanlis Institute for Democracy and the Francisco Sacarnero Institute. It is titled Transition to a Smart Green Europe. If you'd like to ask our panelists about this topic, please do so on Facebook. To guide us through this important conversation is our moderator, Dimitar Lilkov, a research officer at the Martin Center. The floor is yours, Dimitar. Thank you, Theo, and a warm welcome to our online guests. My name is Dimitar Lilkov, and I'll be moderating today's panel. The European Green Deal and the transition towards a cleaner economy has been a hot topic in Brussels and also in European capitals. However, the challenge of making Europe's economy more sustainable is not only about making it greener, but also about making it smarter. The combination of breakthrough technologies and green policies give us our best shot at actually achieving carbon neutrality and making this political goal politically and practically possible. So with this in mind, Europe needs not only a general long-term plan, but also a very detailed blueprint for achieving these goals. In today's panel on transitioning to a smart green Europe, we'll be talking about the cross-section between uh, innovation, breakthrough innovation, and green policies so that Europe can achieve its quest towards carbon neutrality and a greener economy. And I'm really happy that today we're joined by two professionals who can give their perspectives, both from the European level and also from the national perspective as well. So today we are joined by Maria de Graça Carvalho, who is a member of the European Parliament. She has extensive public, um, public policy experience and public involvement, as she's also been uh, Minister for Science and Education in Portugal. Maria is also a full professor in the University of Lisbon. Bom dia, Maria. We are also joined by Alexandra Zduku. She is Secretary General for Energy and Mineral Resources at the Greek Ministry for Environment and Energy. Ms. Zduku is an experienced public policy professional who has been involved in various advisory roles in the Greek administration, and she's really knowledgeable about energy policies, uh, geopolitics, and also legal affairs. Kalamera Alexandra. I'm really, really happy to be, to, be, to be in the presence of both of you today. Before we kick off the panel, I would just like to remind our audience that we are running live. If you have any questions, please post them on Twitter, on Facebook, get in touch and we'll have a short Q&A session in the last 10-15 minutes of the panel. So, we're about to begin. Member of the European Parliament, Maria de, Carva de Graça Carvalho, can you please share your vision for a smart green Europe? Um, thank you very much. First, uh, I would like uh, to uh, say hello to Dimitar, to Alexander, and say that I'm very happy to be part of this uh, important uh, conference. And we have very recently joined the, the Martin Center as uh, I'm now uh, president of the Institute of Francisco Sacanair. We exist for 40 years, but uh, only now we have joined as full members. And actually, more or less at the same time, we have uh, the agreed uh, uh, protocol of collaboration. We have signed a protocol of collaboration with our Greek friends from the Institute Constantin uh, Karamali. So I'm really happy to with both of you to have uh, this event and this uh, debate in an area that is my main area of work as a, a professor because exactly I'm a professor of energy and sustainable development and climate change in the University uh, of Lisbon uh, at in parallel with my um, uh, political career as you have mentioned. Uh, in my introductory remarks, um, I, I would like to stress uh, three points. One of them is the, uh, the importance of being um, pragmatic and of implementation. Uh, we have uh, quite ambitious targets from the European point of view and member states uh, to achieve in 2030 in order to be climate neutral in 2050, but uh, we are uh, not uh, attracted to uh, 
to get the targets of 2020, especially on the energy efficiency. So it is a question of credibility that at the same time that we are ambitious and we do very good plans for the future, we also uh, do our best to implement, to do the transposition for uh, the member states of all the, the, the directives. And we have already a, a, a big construction that was done in the previous uh, uh, college um, on the clean energy package that needs to be implemented. So before we go, jump to be more ambitious, and we should be more ambitious, but we really need to make sure that we implement what we have in order to be credible in our future ambitions. So this is my first message. Uh, implementation uh, in starting with the energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is very important because it's the safest way, it's the cheapest and more affordable way to save energy and to reduce uh, the CO2 emissions, mainly uh, in the in the area of uh, buildings. There uh, is the most affordable way, uh, if we do a cost-benefit analysis, uh, to achieve our ambition. So energy efficiency is very important after you have the, the, the electricity uh, production, but start with energy efficiency that will be, and we is, is exactly on the targets of energy efficiency that Europe is is falling behind. My second uh, point is the role of technology. Uh, we, we need to achieve our targets, uh, but in a affordable, uh, accessible, and clean energy for all. And uh, we have two ways. Uh, one is to change completely our uh, style of life, uh, not to travel, to, to have less comfort in the houses. The second is to have clean uh, uh, technologies that allow us to continue in the, with a certain comfort of, in our life, but uh, uh, technologies that are not so expensive that will damage our economy. I think that we will need a mix of these two uh, ways. Uh, uh, we have to, to, in certain way, to adapt a bit our style of life, but not completely change. Uh, we really praise our mobility uh, to, to have a comfortable life. So we really need to uh, invest in technologies that are affordable, that are clean, that will allow us uh, to have our, the, the way we have been living in Europe with some moderation, but they will continue uh, to, to live and to produce um, in our industry uh, in a way that is clean uh, using affordable technologies. And uh, in order to, to, to achieve the ambitions that we have, the targets for 2030 and 2040 and 2050, we still do not have all the technologies available. We, uh, in the heavy industry, uh, the industry that they are very consumed of energy, like the cement industry, glass, ceramics, so many industrial sectors, we still need a steel industry, uh, we still need to uh, develop more technologies, the same with aviation, uh, the same with uh, big trucks and uh, shipping, cruises. So we really need to develop uh, more the technologies. In some cases, technology already exists, but it needs to be scaled up. In others, it's, we, we do not have the technologies yet. So the role of research and innovation uh, in order to develop this uh, clean, affordable technology is very important. I'm the moment rapporteur in the European Parliament of the partnerships inside Horizon, Horizon Europe, where we, uh, are going to be, we are going, the EU is going to finance part of these technologies, technologies like the uh, bio-based technologies, uh, hydrogen, uh, so uh, several, uh, um, uh, the clean aviation, the clean rail, so several partnerships are uh, um, in order to, to finance the next generation of technologies that will allow us to achieve these targets. And many scenarios say that to, to, to achieve the climate neutrality, the last bit of the decarbonization, we need uh, to have negative technology. We need to have 
capture technology or even uh, negative technology. And there, there is a lot to be done in research and innovation. CCUS combined with biomass, even direct air capture, we don't know, still very expensive. We're still in early stage of development, but it's important to, uh, to have uh, uh, to continue and the, the role of next week we will vote in Parliament or uh, or uh, in the Planner Horizon Europe and the European Institute of Innovation and Technology that together with the regional funds and with the recovery plan are going to be very important tools that will allow the researchers, entrepreneurs and our industry to develop the right technologies. Uh, also, the combination of this technology, or energy technology, is the digital world for the smart grid, grids, for the energy efficiency. We can use the digital in order to help to achieve the green uh, transition. Really, the digital transition and the green transition should be uh, go hand in hand. And my last point is the, the role of the end users and the empowering of end users. We cannot do this transformation against people. We really need to involve the citizens. But for that, they need to understand and to have basic skills so that they can provide and they can themselves build some of the, the solutions. And I, I think again on the energy efficiency, there is a lot that can be done by each of us in their house, their office in their industries uh, um, that uh, simple solutions that if you understand uh, how energy works that we can do to to improve the the situation so empower skills empowering the people creating the uh, energy communities and together with this some of the decentralization of energy will be very important uh, and energy, especially the, the, the electricity production, has been very centralized in many member states like my own. And I think that will be important that we start creating the decentralization of energy production, empowering people, giving them the know-how that they can provide their own solutions, both on the uh, production, the um, electricity and heat production, but also on the energy efficient solution. So this is my three main message to start with, and I look forward to the, the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Indeed, you, you, you stressed a couple of points, and I would, I would gladly come back to them uh, throughout our discussion, especially when we talk about the goals, when we talk about implementation, and very interestingly as well, the impact on, on our societies and how, how our societies need, need to, uh, to adjust. But before we go into our, in our live discussion, I would like to turn to, to Alexandra, and maybe we can hear more um, from your perspective from a national level, and maybe you can brief us shortly on, on Greece's ambition when it comes to successful green initiatives. The floor is yours, Alexandra. Good morning, first of all, from uh, Athens, shiny Athens uh, in Greece. Uh, let me first of all congratulate uh, this initiative, uh, Martin Center, in cooperation with the Institute for Democracy, Kostandinos Karamalis, a uh, wonderful idea to discuss about this topic, but also let me uh, say hello to, to Maria. I'm uh, really honoured to share a panel with, uh, with a prominent member of the European Parliament and academic. So hello, Maria. Um, we'll have the chance to, to uh, share views uh, later. So um, first of all, and uh, before we go to uh, what is happening in, uh, in my country, uh, let me share a few thoughts on, uh, on the green and digital future um, and uh, how this will happen in the, in the continent. So I, I will start saying that, well, you know, as policymakers, we constantly come across two fundamental approaches, two key choices for our future. On one hand, it's the green transition, a very hot topic, as you said, Dimitar. So um, what is this? It's our collective effort to, to move away from uh, polluting fossil fuels, to promote renewables, to reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions, and generally to address the, the danger of global uh, warming. On the other hand, it's the digital transition, the, the transformation. So our attempt 
to use the advantages uh, offered by new technologies in order to, to improve our lives. Uh, we have a, a commitment to embrace the, the fourth industrial revolution, to promote the Internet of Things, to introduce smart devices, uh, smart processes, uh, smart choices, uh, everything smart in our life and uh, our work. Those two transition, uh, the green and the digital, I think they are at the forefront of uh, EU strategic priorities. And obviously they are the key drivers in many policy choices. The, the recovery and uh, resilient facility perfectly, I think, illustrates the importance uh, given by the EU to, to those two processes. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, uh, the, the regulation that, that uh, established the, the, the RRF uh, refers to six pillars, meaning six policy areas of uh, European uh, uh, relevance that are eligible for RRF funding. The first two pillars, it's not a coincidence, that are the green transition and the digital uh, transformation. And, you know, this prioritization is not only theoretical, but uh, it is also reflected where it really counts, and this is the RRF's budget. Uh, again, we all know that uh, member states must allocate at least 37% of the budget to the first pillar, the green transition, but also at least 20% of the budget must go to the second pillar, the, the digital transformation. I think this is the largest financing mechanism ever created by the union, uh, almost two thirds uh, of its available uh, funds to those two priorities, uh, as I call them, the twin transitions. I think this says a lot, but you know, even uh, this doesn't describe the whole story. Uh, I think that there's a deeper reading here. So if you allow me, I will share with you a story uh, it, that comes from the near future. It's a snapshot of our life uh, in some years from now. So uh, let's say a nice Tuesday uh, in April, like today, I will finish uh, work. I will enter my car to go home. My car will be electric, of course, will drive itself. As I approach my home, it will uh, automatically notify over the internet my smart coffee maker to have my favorite coffee ready when I arrive. Um, as we drive home again, my car will also check current dynamic electricity price. And uh, if it falls under a certain threshold, it will also notify my washing machine to do my laundry. If the electricity price is too high at that moment, it will check again in an hour or two. My home will, of course, be at the perfect temperature for the season since heating and cooling will be automatically regulated all day, depending on the surplus uh, energy uh, I have from my you know, installed roof solar panels. And when I will arrive home, I will uh, unlock the front door from my cell phone. And uh, while my smartwatch complains that I haven't walked uh, the, the doctor prescribed daily limit yet, I will sit on the couch uh, to watch a movie. In the meantime, my car will park itself in the garage. Um, it will be filled um, at my charging station. Um, and after a few minutes, I will get a notice on my TV that my laundry is done or, or that I forgot to pour the coffee. So the technologies that I, with some exaggeration I described, are not science fiction, are not pilot uh, projects in a, in a lab somewhere. Uh, everything mentioned above is uh, technology that uh, is not only applied today, but also it, it is commercially viable. You could have everything mentioned above installed in your home and car today. The reason I share this story is to make a point. There is no green transition and digital transformation. There are no uh, two distinct pillars. Um, it's one thing and it's the same. The smart green transition, um, as the panel uh, so eloquently puts it, 
um, without a conjunction between them. So one single process, a change that is uh, sweeping us off our feet and taking us full speed ahead to the future. There is no digital transformation without the green transition. We depend more and more on uh, automated processes, on smart devices, on computing power, on increased mobility, and in a few years on also on artificial uh, intelligence. So this creates, an, uh, I think, an unprecedented demand for energy and particularly for electricity. And this increased demand for energy puts obviously enormous strain on our planet's resources. So to achieve the digital transition without jeopardizing uh, our planet's future, we need to go green. And at the same time, there is no green transition without digital transformation. It's not enough, of course, to replace you know, a few gigawatts of uh, coal-fired plants uh, with renewables to achieve the green transition. We need to change how we think about energy and how we use it. And Maria very well said the, the third uh, message about uh, end users. So we need to introduce technological solutions that maximize uh, the benefit we get from the resources we use. Uh, we need to optimize resource use. We need to produce less, but to get more uh, value, more benefit from it. We need to go digital. We need to go smart. I think that we are at a unique point in our history. Uh, and uh, through a combined uh, smart green transition, we will get there. We can get as an economy, as a society, as uh, individuals. Of course, there are dangers. Um, perhaps chief among these is the concept of digital security. You know, in an interconnected world, losing, for example, electrical power, even for a brief amount of time, might have catastrophic impact to the economy, to our health, to our way of life. This is a danger I think we need to take very seriously to ensure the progress and prosperity promised by the smart green transition, we need to take active steps today, now, to ensure the ongoing security and stability of the systems and infrastructure uh, that will bring uh, about that progress and prosperity. In Europe, and I'm finishing with that, uh, we lead the world in this time of change. Having said the two key priorities, going green and going digital, we now need to set an example of, on how to implement them by uh, treating uh, the, the twin transitions as a single process by understanding that they are not only closely related but they are interdependent and interlinked by planning and putting into action um, comprehensive policies that exploit the synergies and complement both targets. Uh, so thank you very much, and I will be happy to to exchange now some views on that. Fantastic. Um, thank, warm thanks to both of you for for setting the pace for opening the debate. There's a number of issues you sketched in your in your remarks. So I would like to follow up with a couple of questions. Please bear in mind that uh, we have only 25 minutes left. So if possible, keep to one to two minute um, uh, answers. Um, MEP Carvalho, I, I really like the point you made about adjusting our societies. I would like to ask you, what's the impact? How difficult is implementation when we talk about these measures? And how difficult is for our societies to accept these measures when you think about your own country, for example? Because this is a topic of wide concern throughout Europe. How to make this transition work and also how to make it socially acceptable? Um, yes, you touch a, a very important topic. My own country, Portugal, has done well in the renewable energy, but is a, a centralized measure. So, has been a, a big, we have a quite centralized system of the electricity production with the, the large companies in, in charge of the, uh, the electricity production and uh, unfortunately these, these, these companies have been very much pushing for renewable energy. So uh, we are doing well in the electricity uh, based on renewables. Uh, we are uh, not doing so well on the energy efficiency. 
um, on buildings and on transport. We have not been able, like most of the, the, the European countries, to decouple the, the, the uh, economy. And any time that there is a recovery on the economy, we have increase, an increase of energy consumption. And we, through, through technology, through the use of digital, like Alexandra has explained, uh, of uh, control, of uh, using digital technologies, we, may, we, are able, we will be able to decouple uh, the, the recovery on economy from the uh, increase of uh, energy use. Uh, and that is very important, and that has not ha uh, happened yet. So uh, we continue to, to grow in terms of the energy consumption in buildings and in transport. Uh, and there, um, there is probably two main reasons. One uh, is we still have is a country that has low salaries and some of the solutions uh, uh, may be still expensive and there are in the in the people's mind other uh, uh, priorities in, in their their life the education of the the kids the the, the health that uh, they have to 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 um, to spend their their wage that are still uh, quite low and the the second point is that we didn't yet empower people both in the digital and in the energy sector and this uh, transition that is a twin transition, as Alexander also has stressed, the green and the digital transition uh, will be successful if we are able to empower people through knowledge. We need to give uh, basic skills in both areas to the to the European citizens and to uh, people that live in Europe. And also the recovery and the resilience plan can be an opportunity that we also do training, not only for the specialists, not only to have engineers or technicians, but that we gave basic knowledge both in the areas of digital and on energy efficiency to the population so that we are able to empower these people, everyone, uh, to, to in their daily life to have better solutions for their life, better solutions for the environment and that are much more efficient and much cleaner. So the skills is a very important topic mm -hmm. of this transition. Thank you very much. Um, Alexander, I turn to you. Um, you painted a, a, a very interesting positive picture for the future, utopian maybe. Um, from your perspective, what can the national government do to facilitate these policies and make sure that the, the picture you painted actually happens? I think you are muted. Sorry. Perfect. I was saying I was saying that I fully agree with Maria. I think uh, more or less Greece maybe is at the same position with uh, Portugal. We need a lot of to do a lot of work uh, to um, for the social acceptance uh, for the energy transition. I think social acceptance is uh, is high uh, for the digital uh, aspect of uh, the ongoing transition, and I think that it's above average for the green component still there. Uh, we as well in Greece, we have a centralized system and we must make a lot of effort to decentralize it and convince uh, end users to utilize uh, better uh, the energy resources. Okay, in Greece, we have an ambitious uh, program for uh, greening uh, our economy and uh, society. Um, as you know, Greece has committed to remove all uh, lignite-based uh, production from its uh, electricity mix by 2028, uh, a, a very um, ambitious indeed target. Uh, this means that all currently operating uh, lignite assets uh, will be decommissioned by, and it's not far, you know, 2023, uh, and only one will remain in operation until 2028. Uh, of course, this ambitious goal um, will make Greece this is what we hope to, uh, the, the first European country to fully uh, decommissioning its uh, coal-based uh, uh, generation. At the same time, um, 
As Maria said, we aim to double our renewable energy generation by 2030, uh, aiming to reach um, a 20 gigawatt of installed uh, renewable capacity. Um, to be honest, um, the, the interest so far from, uh, from investors shows that we can reach uh, as Greece this goal. Uh, and we can reach it well ahead of, uh, of our schedule, possibly by the middle point uh, of the decade. Uh, but we need again to make a lot of effort to introduce the digital and uh, smart component in our green transition. Um, uh, we made uh, si some serious steps to, to digitalize uh, uh, our licensing processes here in Greece in order to facilitate investors to invest in renewables. Uh, moreover, and I'm, I'm very glad Maria mentioned that, it is also a, a pillar of great significance also for Greece, the renovation wave and the energy efficiency pillar. Um, we are um, we're having uh, energy efficiency programs, like for example, uh, an one billion uh, energy efficiency programs, a program that subsidizes energy efficiency uh, investments for creating uh, smart uh, buildings, um, but also promoting uh, self-production uh, and consumption. Um, and, uh, of course, we, we acknowledge this close link uh, between technological innovation uh, with the green smart uh, transition, and this is uh, why we, we promote an ambitious program to, to incentivize companies uh, that are active in uh, new technologies and have an active uh, R&D component. Uh, for example, uh, e-mobility project or uh, electricity uh, storage uh, or hydrogen, as um, we mentioned uh, earlier. All these new technologies, I think, they are part of this uh, uh, plan um, uh, to, to transit in a new uh, era. Uh, of course, we have to do a lot of uh, work, uh, but it's very challenging, I think, for all countries. Uh, we have the tools, and I'm confident that some, somehow we can make it with a lot of work. Fantastic. Um, I have a couple more questions, but before that, I would like to open up the debate because I think we have interest from our live audience. So over to you, Theo. Thank you, Dimitar. Indeed, there are several questions from social media. Here's two of them. The first question is, what can businesses and citizens across the EU do to accelerate these processes in the short term? And the second question is, who do you believe will gain the most from these new technologies of a smart green Europe? For example, citizens, SMEs, or the agricultural industry? Over to you, Dimitar. Yeah, two uh, short and sweet questions. First of all, what can businesses do to facilitate this change? And also, who will gain the most from, from these, these policies? Um, MP Carvalho, would you like to comment on either of these questions? Um, they are related, th these questions. I think that uh, if we are able to, to develop the technology, to, give the, to, to empower people through skills, I think everyone will gain. The, the citizens, because we will live in a, clean, uh, a cleaner world, more affordable uh, 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 energy prices uh, and also the business that we can continue to have the, the industry and business in Europe uh, not need to, de uh, to to send that this business go away from Europe and they, con they can continue here in a competitive way. I, I draw your attention that in some of the member states one of the problems of the industry is the high price of energy. So we, in order to, to have a clean uh, energy, we cannot uh, uh, go to higher prices than we are already, uh, already have because of the localization of these industries. So it will be very important. So industry, citizens, everyone will win from this, this transition. Fantastic. Alexandra, your thoughts on that? I fully agree with Maria. You know, uh, in this journey, um, we are all uh, an integral part uh, of this uh, of this journey. Business and citizens, uh, they are at the heart of these uh, transitions. 
consumers as, uh, as informed participants and also presumers. Uh, this is something that we need to build on uh, during this decade. Uh, the, the companies, the SMEs, uh, as uh, renewable generators, um, energy efficiency service providers in many roles, uh, but also SMEs are significant consumers. So um, somehow business citizens, we are all linked uh, to this challenge. Uh, each one from its uh, point has several challenges to face. Uh, but again, uh, it's up to us, you know, the countries to create um, the necessary tools, the necessary regulatory frameworks to boost uh, these, um, uh, these challenge and the energy transition uh, for all stakeholders. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to elevate this conversation on the European level. We've talked about national policies, we've talked about our societies, but let's see what ha what's happening on the, on, the, on the macro level and what are the biggest issues there. So the thing I have, I'm bearing in mind right now is Europe's long-term budget, the MFF, and especially the recovery plan uh, for transitioning and for um, more or less recovering our economies after the COVID-19 pandemic. So question to both of you, maybe we can start with MEP Carvalho. Do you think that the recovery plan is ambitious enough when we talk about a smart green Europe? And do you think our long-term budget is equipped so that we can actually achieve these goals? And if not, what needs to change in the next couple of years? Because we're in a very dynamic situation, socially and economically. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. But before I enter to the European uh, scene, let me just say one thing to Alexander, uh, that uh, I had the privilege and I still have to cooperate with a, a lot of researchers from Greece. Uh, fantastic researchers in the area of energy uh, in the in decentralized in decentralized solutions that you can have in your islands. So I have cooperated with NTUA from Athens, Thessalonica, Cres, and you really have top class researchers in Greece. Uh, and also agencies, uh, regional energy agencies, and uh, uh, congratulations for that. They do very well at European in the European programs, and uh, uh, it's uh, very good for Greece that you also have uh, on top of uh, the, the the more centralized uh, replace the lignite uh, electricity production. You also continue with these solutions for the fantastic islands that you have that uh, will uh, get also the uh, decentralized system clean and affordable. So let me uh, go back to the to the European scene. What if the recovery plan and the MFF is prepared for the digital? and the green transition. Um, I think that uh, uh, it's not only a question of the, the, the amount, the budget, the, the, the size of the budget. Uh, I'm more concerned on the bureaucracy and the, the rules and the limitations that will make difficult the use of these funds. So if these funds are sufficiently agile uh, flexible and easy to apply, they will make a difference. But if these funds are too complex, too bureaucratic, um, difficult to implement, difficult to create the synergies between the different funds like Horizon Europe and the regional funds and the private funds, that this is a lot of complications to do that because it will be important that we can, for a large project, take a large project like replacing the lignite um, for a cleaner uh, fuel. You really need to, to, to make use of different funds. Uh, horizon for, for the more uh, fundamental and technological development, regional funds, recovery plan, European investment bank, private funds. And if you put all that, and it's very difficult to do, very complex, um, and you lose most of your effort, of your energy in the complexity, and um, that is the, the biggest fear that I have towards this. So it's also up to us, uh, members of the European Parliament, that we 
managed to deliver uh, th these funds and these sub programs that are inside these funds that are sufficiently easy uh, to be used by our companies, by our SMEs, by our startups, the large companies. For them, probably is easier, but still may may have problems. Uh, and also to 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 the citizen in general, that this arrives to the SMEs and to the citizens in an easy and flexible way. So this is the big challenge concerning the budget. Thank you very much. Um, Alexandra, how do you see the recovery plan from, from Athens? Is, is Brussels far away, far attached from national capitals or does the European bureaucracy and the European elite actually know what's happening on the ground and suggesting the proper way forward? Well, okay, in, a, in the public debate, I guess uh, in all uh, EU member countries, uh, RRF is uh, the new trend uh, or the new hope. Uh, Everybody talks about that. Um, so far, um, and during the elaboration of uh, our national plan uh, of the RRF, um, we didn't face yet um, any bureaucratical uh, procedures, uh, but okay, this time was to, to prepare uh, on behalf of um, Hellenic Republic uh, what we want to do with this money, uh, how more efficiently we will allocate these resources to several projects. Of course, the anxiety now and the responsibility is um, on uh, how uh, efficiently and effectively we are going to, um, to, to proceed with, this, uh, with the implementation of these projects and also on time. Time, I think, is of essence uh, in, the, in the RRF system. Um, the clear focus that the, that the EU has placed towards uh, those two pillars, I think it's a very encouraging, first of all, step. Um, and that's because choosing, I think, the uh, two pillars as the two cornerstones of the RRF, um, the, the, the facility aims to increase resilience and facilitate uh, recovery from, uh, uh, from the effects of the pandemic. And this, of course, gives um, a significant added value to the recovery uh, process because we will not only you know recover from this uh, tragic situation but uh, we can emerge uh, better and stronger and uh, greener and smarter if you will um, but also the, the recovery I think that it gives a very strong signal that uh, those two pillars will form the backbone of uh, Europe's resource allocation in the years and the decades to come. Uh, if, uh, if we choose to, to place our collective uh, bet for uh, recovery from the crisis on making uh, our economy greener and smarter, then it's only logical to assume that once, uh, of course, better times uh, return, those two priorities um, will even more heavily uh, be supported and prioritized. So yes, I think that Europe has committed the significant resources in driving this transition, uh, financial, but also uh, politically. Hopefully those resources will prove to be enough, but Maria knows better uh, since she's in the heart of uh, Brussels. Uh, we are here in our small uh, uh, world uh, of the Ministry of Energy. Um, what we hope, of course, is not to have uh, this bureaucracy uh, uh, ahead of us. Uh, we need to have uh, flexible tools to move forward very quickly. Thank you very much. Um, we're running out of time. And before we close, I would like to pose a short question for both of you and keep it maybe in, in one minute. In our societies um, in, in Europe, we have this idea that Europe is the green champion when it comes to policies, when it comes to business solution, when it comes to technology. But we're also pressed with heavy competition, especially when we talk about business uh, from the US or patenting or access to funding, and more and more from China when we talk about technology. So in one minute, can you tell us what are the biggest advantages of Europe and what should be our main focus in the next couple of decades, bearing in mind that we're heavily pressed by competition, East and West? Maria, maybe, maybe over to you. 
Okay, thank you. And the biggest advantage and added value of Europe is the uh, development of new ideas, the research, the more fundamental research and the early stages of the technological development. The biggest barriers is the lack of investment. And so the capacity for the companies to grow, when they need to grow, most of them go outside Europe to the US or other parts of the world. And also the difficulty that we have in the passage of this, the flow of this knowledge to the society and to the economy. And that again is that we don't have a, a vibrant ecosystem around that will make this knowledge to flourish. And what we need for this uh, ecosystem is less bureaucracy, is a fiscal uh, system that works, is a justice system that works. So the conditions that make in, uh, people and companies to invest in Europe to take advantage of the fantastic work that we do in the early stage of the technology development. So we are good in developing the first the ideas, but after to implement these ideas, to make them grow in the industrial scale at special large scale, this happens somewhere else in the world. And this is not good for us because the, we are developing ideas to create jobs somewhere else. We have to invert this situation. Thank you. And um, okay. Alexandra, your closing thoughts in a minute. Uh, microphone, please. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I think leadership uh, in a sector is is not about uh, building more, uh, building uh, cheaper, or even uh, building more advanced technology than our competitors. Leadership, for my at least for. Uh, according to me, involves primarily uh, how you use your position and uh, what you do with your role as a, as a global example. So Europe will continue, I think, to, to lead the, the smart and green uh, transition uh, as long as it continues to use its uh, leadership role to inspire uh, others, uh, to help them uh, achieve progress and prosperity, uh, both externally and uh, internally, externally to our partners and the world. We need, I think, to continue to show that uh, Europe commits to highly ambitious uh, goals and uh, allocates the resources needed to achieve those goals. Furthermore, we need to assist uh, our international partners that have the same ambition as us but lack our resources, as well as to persuade those uh, that have the resources but don't recognize the need for such uh, ambitious action. Internally, we need to make the transition have uh, direct and uh, tangible uh, benefits for our citizens. We need to show that our smart green policies are driven actually by a desire to, to improve life, work, leisure for all Europeans. Furthermore, we need to show that the resources we use to drive uh, the transition. These are common, you know, resources of the European mm -hmm. people uh, help to bring clear and direct value to them that they actually increase the progress, prosperity, the well-being of the European people. So we need to continue to inspire our citizens and our international partners that the, the green transformation we are working towards is to the benefit of uh, our people, our economy, our countries and the world. We need to continue to set the example for the world and by doing so, lead the world to our common uh, smart green uh, future. On this positive note, thank you very much. On this positive note, I would like to close the panel and maybe just give a couple of the most the most important highlights and takeaways from, from this discussion. Our two speakers remind us of the importance of implementing our current legislative initiatives toward achieving our 2030 and long-term 2050 goals uh, when it comes to the environment. The role, the role of technology is key, especially when we talk about changes in the way our societies function and making sure that we do not need to fundamentally alter our, our lives so we can achieve the, these goals. 
Also, technology helps us to decouple economic growth from um, rising CO2 emissions. We should not see economic prosperity and a higher standard of living as something going against the interest of, of the environment. And finally, we discussed the importance of the European Recovery Plan and that we need to uh, act fast and quick in achieving its goals and making sure that bureaucracy doesn't stifle this ambitious goal. Alexandra, Maria, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time. And over to you, Theo. Thank you, Dimitar. And thank you to our panelists for such an impressive exchange of views. This now concludes day two of Network, and I certainly feel like I have already a lot to think about. The good news is that we still have half the journey to go. Make sure to head to our website for the full program and follow our Twitter account, at Martin Center, so you won't miss any of the highlights. See you tomorrow, same place, from 10.15 to 12.45. We'll be featuring a panel on women and the future of Europe, and another on the Green Deal and the middle class, before ending the day with closing remarks by Antonio López Isturiz-White, Secretary General of the EPP. Until then, take care.